what happened to me was that I got lucky because I got to have a second career without a lot of risk. Um, nice. I was, able, I was able to make a lateral move at work right. because the World Wide Web happened. Nobody had expertise or experience, so right. nobody was more qualified than I was. Right. And I could come along and say, well, I, I built a couple of sites in my spare time. Look at these. Um, and I was able to make a shift and still maintain the job security that I had, but completely abandon my original career and then get to do the sort of thing I should have done from the beginning, which was something where I could apply my visual skills. Right. And you know, or organize things. Yeah. Uh, I like organizing. Uh, I like visually organizing. Yeah. Um, communication, all that sort of stuff I'm very good at. Yeah, you were talking um, about in the in the questionnaire. You're talking about like um, ranging things on a page, and yeah. I thought of uh, digital feng shui is what I was thinking. Yeah, so it's it, it's sort of based on a quote that I Paul ran. Was it Paul ran? No, no, it was the guy who did the, the famous Dylan poster, Milton Glaser, uh, one of the world's most famous graphic designers. Mm -hmm. And I saw one of these inspirational quotes somewhere a couple of years ago that I didn't forget, and it said, uh, "My job." is to arrange things on a page until they feel right. Hmm. <laughs> like that sums it up. That, that's the whole field right there, you know, cause it's, there are rules, but it's also kind of mystical, you know, at the same time. So uh, if, if I could tell a young person, if I could give them advice, it would be, don't ever feel that you're locked in, that you don't have any alternatives, that you can't do something else. Everybody can be more than one thing. Yep. Um, uh, everybody's focused on Elon Musk lately, right? And it's so funny because people will talk about, you know, he'll throw these tweets out there and, and Dogecoin will go to the moon and then it'll drop and blah, 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 blah. And, and people are like, yeah, okay, let's assume that he's a genius at, you know, uh, engineering. He doesn't know jack about cryptocurrency. Like, why? You know, you, you you can be a genius in one area and not be a genius at everything, right? And, but like, what, why are we taking um, his, you know, word on like things that uh, he has no expertise in, really? Because right? he's a celebrity. Because he's a celebrity, and people uh, people look to somebody who knows more than they do, or think they know more than they do, mm -hmm. to give them guidance. And that's the sort of thing that politicians take advantage of and other celebrities take advantage of. I, I heard a neat quote though. Um, um, you know, you know, everybody knows Warren Buffett, right? Sure. So his buddy, um, whose name is gonna escape me now because I'm on the spot and I can't remember it. But you know, they, they do these panels for Berkshire Hathaway, right? And they'll, they'll have these meet, shareholder meetings once a year. Well, his buddy said, um, uh, in, in, in um, reference to Elon Musk, um, with all of these superhuman efforts, he's trying to go to the Mars and he's talking about batteries. He's talking about tunneling from coast to coast and, you know, all this crazy stuff. Uh, he said, uh, an old timer told him once, never bet against, no, how do you say, never underestimate estimate the man who overestimates himself <laughs> because he just might do it, you know? Yeah. Like he's yeah. just arrogant enough that he might pull it off and he's got the money to do a lot of things you know that's the thing though he's 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 only got the money and he's not an engineer um i mean he might have engineering training but the people who made spacex a reality yeah. he hired them yes they, they worked it out he didn't right. work it out no you, he you rolled it right you make a good team you you hire a good team and and then they do it that's good it's that's like, that's that's what a good ceo does well, it's like Werner von Braun, right? He didn't design the Saturn V. He didn't build it. He was the project manager. Right. That was his great skill. Right. That and being, being a terrific salesman. Yes. He was a great pitch man. No. He knew how to talk to the American people to sell the program. Yeah. He knew how to talk to politicians to get yeah. their support. And he was a fantastic program manager. Yeah, and he was good on camera. Like I remember actually with the Disney Channel, there was a, yes. a spot where... You know, there's a there's a snippet where he talks about going to the moon, and uh, it's in the 50s, like it's like early 50s and mid 50s or something. I think it was 55, 
and he's good on camera. Like he's still got that real strong German accent, but he's like frequently compared to Carl he's selling it as uh, as one of the first mass media uh, science uh, communicators. You just commit. You just compared him to Sagan. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not. Other people have compared him to Sagan. That's what I thought. I was over talking you when I didn't hear Sagan, but see, that would be a whole other topic that I could get into. Yeah. Uh, we, we started talking about it uh, a few days ago about influential documentary series that yes. exposed you to uh, a world of ideas that you might not have seen anywhere else and how that led to uh, a lifetime of inquiry. You know, it fired the imagination of a young mind. Got Cosmos to... was a uh, history of science as well as science. And um, that mm -hmm. blend is fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. where do people come up with these ideas because i love ideas but i really love ideas in context absolutely and i i remember some basic things like one how did i learn about the rosetta stone it was from sagan uh really? he had an episode yeah absolutely i'd never heard of it before then uh champollion champollion uh um he had a where he talked about that he was in Egypt, might have been in Luxor, I'm not sure where. Uh, I think it was also the same episode where he walks through a, a scale model of the Library of Alexandria, again, which I'd never heard of. I learned about what that was and why it's gone now. And he had a little piece of paper, uh, is Eratosthenes. Uh, how big is the world? How do we know how big the world is? Well, I'm gonna pay a guy to measure the shadow of the stick uh, that's put in vertically in the ground. And from there, I can figure out the angle. And from there, I can figure out the circumference of the earth. Yeah. I was 13, man. It blew my mind. And it was, yeah. it was so big that I can I can retell the entire episode to you right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all I kinds of well, I remember the folding the piece of paper and yeah. Yeah. And he paced yeah. out the, the distance, paid a guy to walk the distance. And this is why I don't like uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, because uh sagan didn't attack religion i mean he he knew he's he's talking to an american audience and attacking religion is a losing proposition you're gonna you're gonna lose them right off the bat uh so he never came out and said you can see now religion's all bullshit right you surely you can see that uh, he doesn't say that um but he says things like um uh where did the universe begin what was there before that uh, the Indians or some culture believed the earth was on a turtle. What was holding the turtle up? Another turtle. What's below that turtle? It's turtles all the way down. You know, if there's a God, who created that God? Where did he come from? And he would leave it at that, right? And then branch off into things like Big Bang and is the universe cyclical or uh, is it, is, is it, it uh, open, right? Open, you know, the heat well, death. For a long time they thought it was, and Einstein was, uh, it, they thought it was steady state. And that was like, and now that seems ridiculous to us, you know? But, but uh, DeGrasse Tyson comes along. I watched one episode of his, his Cosmos series and he went all in attacking religion. I'm like, plus cartoons. I'm like, nah, I'm out. I'm like, nah. you, yeah. Yeah, Giordano Bruno, he started with that, right? Mm -hmm. Is that the first episode? I think so, yeah. And I, I started watching that too, and I was like, nope. It, yeah. The magic, I don't want to ruin the magic. I want yeah. to see Cosmos. Yeah. So I stopped watching it. I have it on DVD, you know, I can break it out uh, once every couple of years or so. What, Sagan's Cosmos? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have it too. Um, but yeah, the, the newer one. So... But but I have to tell you, it was a Super Bowl. You were trolling NGT. <laughs> Sorry, NDGT. Yeah. And uh, it was hilarious. You were saying it was you were saying something like, you know, the distance between Mars, blah, 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 if it were measured out on a football field, would be blah blah blah. Yeah. And you were like, not now, Neil, not now. <laughs> yeah, because he's he's basically a scold. You know, he <laughs> takes the fun out of everything, and Sagan didn't do yes. that. Yes. Why Sagan, do you have to suck Sagan the life out of along. everything? Yeah, he didn't come along and say, like, uh, oh, when spaceships uh, fly across the screen in the movies, that's all nonsense because uh, space is a vacuum and there's no. He, he gave 
uh, the audience credit for not being completely stupid. And Neil deGrasse Tyson talks to people as if they're morons. Yeah, yeah, he does. Yeah, he does. <laughs> no, he does. He, he's he's didactic. He's condescending. He's yeah. he's he's you know like I'm the only one that knows this, and exactly. I will grace you with this knowledge. And that's why I don't like him. His his approach is just bad. I I'm all for anybody who wants to go out there and bring light to a dark world, which is where it feels like we are. Um, but his approach does not work for me. And I don't think it works. What's for the him. Canadian dude? Um, Michi, Michio? Keku? I'm sorry, say it again. Michiko Keku? I love that dude. Yeah. yeah. Um, He's got the right approach. He like seems excited about it when he talks about it. And he wants you to be excited about it too. You know, maybe a little too enthusiastic, but, but much better approach for me. Yeah. And uh, presentation styles have changed a lot. Uh, there are very few, we, we talked about this, the kind of documentary style that we like is kind of like nice and gentle. And the presentation style now is lots of aggressive talking. And if I don't talk fast enough, I'll lose the audience and my pitch rises. And here's animation, 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 cut, 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 cut. Too much, too much. It's all about uh, dazzle. Uh, they seem to be afraid that people's attention span is so short now that that's the only way to keep your attention. Well, Nova, does, Nova Falls for the same thing now. They, they've increasingly embraced this frenetic style of documentary uh, that, I, that I find, I find off-putting. You have you to know, give they, my they brain time to absorb like this stuff, you know? Like I have, to, I have to be able to like retain this information. At least that's what I want. When I watch a documentary, so, well, sometimes I want to be entertained, but but if sure. I want to, if I'm, if I want to absorb the information, you know. So I, I, I don't want it to feel like it's it's one. I don't want it to feel like it's a commercial. Yeah. And I don't want it to feel like it's commercial television, which yeah, you know, Cosmos, this the Neil deGrasse Tyson version felt that way. Yeah. Well, it was commercial television because they had commercial breaks. Um, and, but that's why that's why something like PBS Unbroken, you don't have to worry about. Uh, stopping for dramatic effect before the commercial right. that's really important and you watch british series they don't have to worry about commercials so and it's just a different presentation style and one that resonates with me and maybe that's an age generation thing it might maybe, be it maybe might a 13 year old now would find it more engaging no it might be because uh tara said the other day she was talking to two kids they were like maybe 12 years old or or maybe a little bit older and uh they were talking to each other just rapid fire real fast and uh, Tara said something like, do you know that you guys like just, you know, talk to each other like at super high speed and, and the one kid without apparently intending to, to be ageist just said, yeah, it's a young thing. And like, get, da, 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 da. so maybe yeah. they're used to that style, you know, and, and like fine arts. That's exactly what I thought of. That's <laughs> exactly what I thought of when she told me that story. Then why, didn't you, why didn't you just ask if you could have the ship? Yeah. We, you we might have said, said no. Yeah. <laughs> it was a clever little punchline. It was a ridiculous, uh, a ridiculous uh, plot point, but it was. But we got to meet, but we got to meet the holographic uh, love interest of right. It's probably one of the best first season episodes, which were almost all bad. And, and here was the tie-in. What was really nice was the tie-in where he's in the fake universe, where he's in a holodeck, but he doesn't know he's in a holodeck yes. and until he sees Minuet. Yes. And then he knows, because it's like, what's wrong? And he's like... You can't leave. Yeah. She was a sexual fantasy in a holodeck. She wasn't my wife, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, well, one thing that you mentioned about like history, one of the reasons I like ancient history so much is because there's only so much source material. So anybody can be an expert. Like once you read Livy and Polybius, like, and it's all translated into English, all the rest of it is reading other historians interpretations of those texts. So unless there are any remaining contemporaneous accounts, yeah. And even Livy's 200, 300 years after the fact. So it'd be like you and I, I talk about Andrew Jackson. Mm -hmm. We're not experts on Andrew Jackson. We didn't live. We're not contemporaries. We're in the same culture, the mm -hmm. generations apart. 
but yeah. we we have no special like knowledge of Andrew Jackson, right? It's fascinating. It's fascinating to think that there are, there are so many things that are simply unknowable. Yeah, uh, I love it. I think it's great. Um, Emerson, I think, um, said, "The universe is full of wonderful things, just waiting for our senses to grow sharper." <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I like that one a lot. Yeah. Um, but I also like the idea that you were talking about a friend that you had a conversation with about the 80s and he's like, no, this is history. Yeah. And you know the old saying that the uh, wise men are so full of doubts and fools have none. Bertrand Russell. Bertrand Russell, exactly. Um, but the, the problem the, with the world is that wise men are so timid and, and stupid men are so bold or something like that. Yeah. And that's one of the things of, of, of age. And this is what, and you probably find it too. The older you get, the more of that wisdom you've heard from earlier generations, you begin to resonate with it. You're like, yes. It I, makes sense. I get it because I am now experiencing that feeling yeah. of uh, watching younger people talk about a past that they never lived through and they're totally wrong yeah. or they have a weird interpretation uh, because it's like a fictionalized tv version uh, or a comic strip version right um, and that it's it's one of the fascinating things about getting older is that like yes you know what you do get smarter there is wisdom in age you know when my grandparents seemed wise to me even though they weren't educated they were wise because they were wise in the ways of life Yep. They had seen the cycles repeat multiple times. They had seen the political cycle repeat multiple times. They had seen children, multiple cycles of grandchildren. Um, and you start to get that distant perspective of, I was once part of it and didn't really understand. I'm farther away from the center of the circle now. Mm. I have a higher viewpoint and I can see more of the totality that I ever could before. And the older I get, hopefully the larger and larger of that circle of totality will become. Mm -hmm. And the minutia doesn't matter. You know, the minutia oh, matters much less because you, all the stuff you, that I worried about doesn't matter. So if I can remember that now and say all the stuff I'm worrying about now doesn't matter. I mean, not to like throw caution to the wind, but you know what I mean? Like I, like it really doesn't matter. Yeah you get it's not so much that it doesn't matter you have the perspective of knowing that things that you thought were like life could be life-changing almost never happen and well in fact never happen um and i spent a lot of time worrying about eventualities that never occurred <laughs> and then you realize that most things never occur um and even if they do because occasionally they do you will find your way through it. It's not, it's, it's not going to be a black, you're not going to fall into a black void. Right. You'll find a way because yeah. you found a way before and you yeah. find a way before that. Montaigne said, uh, my life has been full of terrible tragedies, most of which never happen. I read a book about Montaigne. So yeah. I like to find the, I'm always on the search for the big idea book. Yeah. And sometimes just a title will get me. And I've never read, I've never directly read any Montaigne, but there was a book about Montaigne that was called How to Live. Yeah. I'm like, that's the book I'm looking for. <laughs> the manual to life. That's what I want. Like, <laughs> if, if Montaigne had some amazing insights into how to live, let me read that. Uh, so it was interesting. Yeah. You know, it talked, it, talked, um, it was, it was a uh, parallel between uh, anecdotes about his life, how, yeah. how, how he lived his life, and his personal philosophy and the things that he wrote, which didn't always go together. They weren't all consonant, always consonant, as they frequently are. But it was a good book. I enjoyed it. But sadly, I came away not really knowing exactly how to live. Or how to live as, maybe you learned how to live as a 15th century Frenchman, you know, like, I mean. <laughs> yes. We need yeah. a book of the courtier for our, our new age. We need the Castiglione. All right. Well, anything you want to say to the audience as an outro here before we go? Um, wow. Uh, I put you on the spot. Yeah, because now I'm on the hook for something pithy, something memorable, something original. Uh, and when on the spot, it's, it's almost impossible. There is no conflict. 
There's no conflict. I got to pick up the phone because my wife's out. All right. I'm going to I'm gonna go tell your wife I said hi. We'll edit that out. All right. Sounds good, Pat. Take care. Take care. All right.